Hello Interwebs, welcome to Let's Fix Computers. We're doing another computer build today. This one's going to be a little bit different. We are doing the full tutorial how to build a gaming rig. Okay, so while a how to build a computer video isn't the most original concept in the world, it's still something that I haven't actually done on my channel before. Okay, so let's do a quick stock check before we get going here to make sure that we've got all the bits we need. We need a case, we need a power supply, we need a motherboard, then we also need a CPU, we need RAM, we need a hard drive and or an SSD. So I've got a mechanical hard drive and I've got an M2 SSD then we also need a graphics card. And then finally, because most of the CPUs that you buy for high performance computers um, are going to be what are known as OEM CPUs, so it comes as just the chip, we're gonna need a cooling system as well. So we've got a Corsair water cooler back here to go in there. Uh, when you're building in the lower end stuff, a lot of the time the lower end CPUs will come with what is known as a OEM cooler or a stock cooler, and that will give you a basic CPU cooler in the box with the CPU so you may not need one of these. However, we're building a gaming rig here, so even if we did have a stock cooler, we don't really want to use it anyway. We want to use something nice and big and quiet. So, let's get started. The first thing I'm going to do is unbox all these major components, um, because building a computer will create a huge amount of excess packaging, and I don't want that covering all over my workbench while I'm trying to build this thing, so I'm going to unbox everything now and get all the major bits I need out of the way. Okay, so we've unboxed all our components now. I've put all the, I've separated out all the cardboard, all of the paperwork, and all of the cables and fittings. The cardboard can obviously all go into one pile somewhere else. The paperwork and any other small bits and bobs that have come with the, the components are gathered together into one of the cardboard boxes, so I have something to give to the client afterwards. And then all of the fittings and cables and stuff I've got gathered together here. So we've drastically reduced the amount of clutter we have already. When you build the computer, you will make a mess everywhere. It happens every time. So it's a good idea to try and keep that mess under control so you have a nice tidy workspace. The biggest mistake I see people making is they slowly sort of work themselves into a tiny corner on the desk where they don't have any space to move. And that's when you're starting to invite mistakes. Like right now, you know, these components, I can just put these down on the counter, I've got loads of room. Whereas when I've got bits of paper and box piled up all around me, I can't put anything down anywhere. And that means I'm more likely to put it down in a bad place, like on top of screws, on top of a keyboard, on top of someone's cat, and so on. So everything is nice and under control. So we're ready to actually get to the building now. So the first thing we want to do for the actual building is to prep the case. So let's start looking at that. So I'm gonna start out by removing both the side panels of the case and take out any bits that have come with the case. So as you can see, we've got a box of accessories in there. Uh, I'm gonna take that out and I'm gonna look for any other packaging, anything that doesn't need to be in there. Get it nice and clear, nice and open, so it's ready to build in. So in the accessories box that came with the case, I'm gonna find some more useful bits. Um, you will probably have a bag of various case screws of various fittings that we'll go over in just a moment, and you'll probably get some cable ties as well. So we'll put those to one side. Uh, my case has also come with a couple of accessories, some of which I'm gonna use, some of them I won't. I've got an LED strip for the lighting. We're gonna hang on to that. Then uh, this paperwork uh, and these extra fan grills, I'm not gonna be using these, so these can come out and I'll put those with the other paperwork and other fittings that I'm retaining in my box of tricks. So, in the main interior of the case, we've got a selection of wires here for our front panel connectors, USBs, audio, that kind of thing, and we've got a couple of other accessory wires. Um, so, firstly, uh, I need to put this up right and move these cables somewhere else, because, for example, this USB cable, that's going to go to somewhere over here on the motherboard, so this is in the wrong place already. So we're just going to pull all of this out, and then we'll reroute all of these cables.
Now, as well as removing those cables, I'm also going to take off the front panel of the case because I'm going to need access to the front fans. My system is going to have a front mounted water cooler in it, so I need access to here to mount my radiator. Because my water cooler has come with its own fans that will be better than the ones that are in the case, we're going to take out this front case fan. We don't need this one. So let's get it out. Case fans are held in with self-tapping screws, so you can see this screw has a big vicious thread on it that will cut into the plastic of the case fan. So uh, we're removing these ones. The water cooler will not use self-tapping threads. It will have thinner screws that go through the fan without damaging it. However, most of your case fans will probably have these fellas in. Okay, let's make some quick estimates as to where these front panel connectors actually should be for our computer. So here's our motherboard. It's going to be mounted in the computer like that. So if we lay backwards, we can see our USBs are about halfway up on the, on the front side of the board. So our USB 3 connector, that's this blue fella here, that is going to want to come out around here. So this we've undone from both of the cable tidies and we're going to poke it through that hole there. Um, then the front panel connectors for power lights and switches, uh, these will go to the front panel connector on the motherboard, which in this case is down on the bottom right here. It's often labeled as F panel, and in this case you can see it a mile away with its colored connector block on it. So that means that is going to go approximately there. So in this case, we have holes along the bottom of the case here, so we're going to poke those up through there. And then finally, this one that's labeled HD Audio, that is for our front panel headphone and microphone jacks for when you're using an analog headset. Um, so this is going to plug into the audio circuit of the motherboard, which in this case is labeled audio or F audio, and it's in the bottom left of the motherboard. So again, matching it up, that's going to go right in the bottom corner. So we're going to run this cable all the way up to this hole here. And we'll just thread that up there for now. Don't worry about putting lots of excess into the case. We'll deal with that in a moment. We just want all these cables pointing in vaguely the right direction. My other case fan that's at the rear here, it's currently plugged into the case's built-in fan controller. However, I'm going to reconnect it to the motherboard's fan headers because the motherboard will have an auto fan controller on it, which means it will automatically adjust the speed of the fan depending on the computer's temperatures, which is a better way of managing your fans. So I've disconnected it from the case's fan controller and I'm gonna thread this cable back through so I can plug it into the motherboard. And then finally, I'm just going to tie back these extra connectors we've got here using the cable ties that are on my case. Don't worry about getting this bit perfect right now because we are going to have to undo these again at some point during the build. We just want to keep everything roughly under control because cable tidying is a lot easier if you do it slowly and steadily as you go. If you leave all your cable tidying to the end of the build, you'll have a much harder time of it. Next step in our build is to make sure that the motherboard is ready to go into the case. Um, now, on a case like this, I would put the motherboard in before anything else, just so we have the main point of reference that everything is going to connect to. Um, if you're building in a more budget case that does not have the same kind of cable, type, cable management that this one has, um, you may be trying to do clever cable tidying tricks like running certain cables underneath the motherboard. So have a think about that beforehand, but if you're doing this on your first build, I wouldn't be too adventurous with your cable management unless you have a good case with good cable management. So let's grab our motherboard, and I'm going to offer this up to the case and see if all the screw holes line up. So let's just drop that there. We'll just rest it in place while I move cables around. And I'm going to line that up. So these main large holes here that have the uh, grounding on them, these are the main 
anchor points for the motherboard. So the vast majority of motherboards will have nine holes on them. Some smaller boards may have eight holes or even fewer. Uh, and in this case, this motherboard is following the standard meta where the holes are even across the board. They're all in a grid pattern. So I don't actually need to do anything with this at all. All of my standoffs are all in the correct place. Behind each hole is a standoff that is going to hold the motherboard up. On some motherboards, you might find that some of the screws, such as this one or this one, are in slightly different locations. And so what you may need to do then is take your motherboard back out again, and you might need to move, for example, this standoff, you might need to unscrew that and put it in that hole instead. And again, this one might need to move, or some of these ones may need to come out, and so on. However, because this board is very standardized and follows the standard hole pattern, I don't need to move any of these at all. So this board is ready to go in. However, before I can drop it in, I need to put in the IO shield, which is this fella here. This makes sure that the back of my case, which currently has a square hole in it, will have all the correct holes for the ports on my motherboard. The IO panel is a simple push fit mechanism. So it's just a tin plate, basically. So we're gonna line this up at the back of the case, and then I'm going to press it in at the corners so it should click into place. And I'm just gonna go around the edges and make sure it's in properly. And that's done. All right, let's drop this motherboard in forever now. To actually screw our motherboard into place, we're going to need some of the case screws that came with the chassis. So I'm gonna open up my bag of case screws here, which on this particular case are very unhelpfully all completely mixed up. Um, so most of the time, these screws will come already sorted, but we're gonna to have to have a quick hunt through these to find the ones we need. So these standoffs vary in design. Some of them use the metric thread and some of them use the imperial thread. So just so you know what I'm talking about here, if I pick out two of these screws, this is the metric thread, this is an M3 thread, and this is the imperial thread, which is some weird imperial measurement that I don't understand because I'm British. Um, so notice that this one is coarse and this one is fine. So most of the time I just simply refer to them as fine, fine thread or coarse thread. But in all technicality, one of them is imperial and one of them is metric. And very annoyingly, PCs use a mix of the two. Now we don't know which thread these standoffs will take. So I'm just going to take the imperial threaded screw and I'm gonna test it in that standoff. And that's not screwing in very nicely at all. That immediately is jamming up in the thread without just a finger tightness. So let's try the metric thread. There we go, that one's going in. So my standoffs are metric threaded. So I need to pick out nine metric thread screws. So we're gonna take nine matching metric thread screws out of my selection here. And now finally it's time to actually put the motherboard in. So I'm gonna put one hand on the back of the board and I'm going to guide it into the case. And as soon as I can, I'm going to get these audio connectors into the holes at the back of the case in that I.O. panel. And that will, make, that will let me know that the board is actually aligned properly. So I'm going to very gently push it against the back of the case as I lower it down. And once I've got these holes lined up, we know that the, the motherboard is in place. Now, thankfully, on my case, my center standoffs all stick up slightly, so they poke into the motherboard and hold it in alignment you might have to hold your motherboard in place while you do this. However, if you've got a high quality case, you'll probably have standoffs like these that will hold the motherboard in place. And now I can just put those nine screws into the standoffs to hold the motherboard in. Finally, I'm just checking all my screws. Now, computer screws do not need to be tight. Remember, this is not a car. It's not gonna be going over loads of bumps and ruts in the road, and not everything is all gonna be shaken to hell. All these screws just need to be done up just to biting point so they're not going to fall out. And that leaves everything nice and secure without stripping any threads 
or making it difficult to maintain the computer at a later point in time. So, now our motherboard is all screwed and in place, we've now got our start point where everything else is going to connect to. The next step in this journey is going to be our power supply, because the power supply has the biggest, heaviest cables in the computer. So we want to get all of those into place now, while there's lots of room to maneuver everything. Now, on my case, I have this big power supply enclosure down here, which means I've got to put in my power supply from the other side. However, this is going to vary drastically depending on what case you buy. If your case has a removable shroud for the power supply, or no shroud at all, you'll be able to drop your power supply just straight into the bottom of the case here. However, for me, I've got to put mine upright. So, let's go vertical again. Power supplies come in a couple of different flavours. In this instance, we have a semi-modular power supply, which means most of the cables are detachable from the back of it, which means we only connect up the ones that we need, and that reduces the number of cables in the computer, making it tidier. The ones that are still here, we have the ATX power cable, which is for the motherboard, and then we have the CPU power cable, sometimes known as the AUX power cable. This one also plugs into the motherboard, but it plugs in up near the CPU. Um, on a fully modular power supply, these two are also removable. However, that's a bit of a token gesture, unnecessary feature, because you'll always need these two, so there's no real need to make them modular. However, in the higher end market, when you go on to very high power or very high quality power supplies, they're generally fully modular just for the sake of it. Right, let's get my power supply fitted. So there are two ways you can do this. The, the cooling fan on the power supply here will suck air into the power supply and blow it out the back of it. Now, on the majority of modern cases, your power supply goes at the bottom of the case and there will be a vent on the bottom of the case that will probably have a dust filter on it. So, uh, I am notorious for mounting power supplies upside down because I don't like this design because it basically means my power supply is sucking up all the dust off of my desk or even worse off of the floor of the room that the computer is in. Yes, there is a dust filter there, but it means you have to regularly clean that out. So on this case, uh, as you guys saw in the previous picture, um, the uh, power supply cover is actually vented which means I can put my power supply with the fan facing upwards so it's drawing air from inside the computer that has already been filtered at the front of the case. This means less dust is going into my power supply. So I'm going to mount my power supply with the fan pointing upwards. Take note though, if your computer case does not have a vented cover, such as on NZXT cases and on Corsair cases, you'll need to put your fan facing down onto that vent and you'll need to remember to regularly clean out that dust filter. Otherwise, your power supply is gonna fill up with dust and melt. Power supplies are always screwed in using the Imperial thread screws. Your power supply will probably come with a set of four of these. If not, we can use the Imperial thread screws that came with the case. I recommend putting in the screws just as a loose fit, just so you can move the power supply around and make sure that it's properly centered in the case. Now we have our first two power cables in the computer. Now, the big, thick ATX power cable, this is gonna go up to about halfway up your motherboard. So again, we're gonna be going out of this entrance here on the case. So I'm gonna route that up and put that through that hole right away to get it right out of the way. And I'm just going to look over on the other side of the computer just to check where that's coming out and make sure it's the right way around. And now I can undo my cable management ties here and just thread that in. The ATX power cable usually goes to the top left of the motherboard up in this corner here. So the usual method for this is to route this cable up the side of the case, like so on. So there will usually be some kind of hole in the top of your case. Let me put this down so you can see it. So I can now run this cable up to here and poke it through the top of the case. And I'm just gonna carefully lay this cable roughly in place. I'm not gonna worry too much about making it perfect right now because we wanna make it all connected up and then we'll worry about tidying the cable. All right, let's connect those power cables up. So I've got my CPU power cable at the top here. 
So I'm going to turn that round and push that onto the connector. The ATX power cable um, can commonly split. You'll notice we have a 20 plus four pin here. The reason for this is, is um, years and years ago, this connector used to be 20 pins and then they added an extra four pins for additional power onto it. And for reasons unknown, they still give you a splitting connector just in case you're plugging this into a 2002 era motherboard. So, uh, so yeah, make sure those are to make sure that these are nicely connected, and then we're going to gently twist and bend this connector over. And if we need to, we'll just pull a little bit more slack through, and then we'll plug that into the motherboard. Now when you're pressing this connector in, try and get your fingers just underneath the motherboard just so you don't bend the board pressing this into place because it is a very stiff connector. I've never broken a motherboard this way but I can fully believe that it's possible. And then just make sure that the locking connector on the other side has fully closed on the, on the clip. And then while I'm here, I'm also just going to plug in my USB 3 connector as well. So again, I'm just gonna gently turn that over and plug that in. And that's ready to go. So while we're connecting up cables, let's do our extra front panel connectors that we've got here as well. So our audio connector, this one has a blanks off pin on it and you'll find a corresponding missing pin on the audio connector on the motherboard. So I'm going to plug that in and then I'm gonna push the excess of the cable back into the interior of the case. So we'll just route that back down there nicely, so that's nice and tidy and out of the way down there. Now, now these noodly front panel connectors are for the power switch, the hard drive light, and so on. Now, on this particular case, we've got just the three of them because the power LED is powered from elsewhere in the computer. However, you'll probably have four. You'll have a power LED, a hard drive LED, a power switch, and a reset switch. As you can see, they're all labeled up. Now, the switches, it does not matter how these things are wired up. However, the LEDs have a plus and a minus on them that do need to be the right way round. Now, if you don't have a plus and a minus on the wires themselves, look for a colored wire. So in this case, the dominant color is black and we have gray wires to denote the plus cable. If you have colored wires on your case, the colored wire will be your plus and you may have a color and a white, for example. Then the white will be the dominant and the colored wire will be your plus lead. So let's wire these in. As you can see on the connector, we do have little plus symbols in those to denote where the pluses are as well. Again, it only matters on the LED. The rule of thumb is that the plus, the positive pins are always toward the back of the motherboard. So this is the back over here, and this is the front over here. So all of our pluses on the LEDs are generally toward the back. So let's get those hooked up. Now, you can either look in the motherboard manual um, or usually on the motherboard itself, there will be a guide on how to wire these up. Let me just see if I can get you a shot of that on this particular board. So you can just see on the other side of the connector there, there's writing directly underneath the connector. That's how I know where these go. It's labeled HDD LED, power switch, and so on and so forth. This guide is also in your motherboard manual. Now those are in place, I'm just gonna feed the excess through back into the case. And then we have some nice tidy wires down the bottom there. Okay, now it's time to fit in the interior components on the motherboard. So we're gonna start out with the RAM. So memory slots vary in their arrangement and how many of them there are on the motherboard. Um, if for the sake of the video, I will refer to them as one through four counting from the CPU. So we're gonna go one, two, three, four. Now, on the motherboard itself, they may be labeled differently. For example, on this motherboard, they're actually labeled one, two, three, four. However, I've seen other Intel motherboards where it's the exact opposite of that, and they call them one, two, three, four. So because the labeling mechanism isn't really standardized, I always count them one, two, three, four, starting from the CPU, and that makes it nice and easy to understand. Now, some motherboards will accept your, your memory in any configuration that you can insert them into the board. 
However, other motherboards tend to be very fussy and will not post if they're not in exactly the right place. In any instance, there is an, uh, there is an optimal configuration for the RAM, and on an Intel board, that is slots 2 and 4. On an AMD board, it is generally 1 and 3. Now, we're on Intel here, so we're going to be going 2 and 4. So I'm going to open those slots up at both ends to make sure they're ready for our modules. On some motherboards, you might find that only one end of your slot actually latches open and closed, and the other end is fixed. These are a pain in the backside, however, I'll show you how to deal with those as well. So, let's get our memory modules. Notice that the memory module has an offset slot cut into it, and we have a corresponding notch in the slot. So, we can match that up and know that our modules are going to go in that way around. So the notch lines up with the slot. So for this one, I'm going to line it up in the slot like so, so it drops in. And now to make sure that it's fully locked into place, what we're going to do is place our index fingers on the two latches, my thumbs on the ends of the module, and I'm going to press down firmly with my thumbs while I press these latches in at the same time, like this. And that's it. If you're doing it right, you'll need almost no effort. If you're having to press really hard, it's probably that you're not pressing down hard enough, or it's probably that these are not lined up properly or something like that. You shouldn't need excessive force. So let's do it again. And there we go. Now, if you have one of those awkward motherboards that only latches at one end, it will probably be this end that is fixed. And what you have to do there is line up one end into the slot and make sure that it's fully inserted into the slot. And then your other end, same deal, index finger and thumb, lock it into place. So as you can see, it goes in just as easily. However, I don't like that latching mechanism because it feels like I'm scraping the pins in the slot. So I prefer this style one where they latch at both ends. Next on the agenda is our M2 SSD. This is the main storage that we're going to use on this computer and it goes into this M2 slot. Now M2 cards come in a variety of heights so as you can see we have various hole points along from this slot. Now the, uh, the 80 millimeter version is the standard length so that is where this screw hole currently is. If I have a shorter or a longer SSD, I can remove this standoff and put it in one of the other holes. However, this is already in the correct position for my standard SSD. So I'm gonna remove the hold down screw and position my SSD in. So we're gonna put this in at a 45 degree angle and press it firmly into the slot. And then I'm just going to let it lay flat on the board like that. Now, I know it's fully inserted into the slot, because the hole and the end of the card now line up nicely. And I can just screw that hold down screw back into place. And we're done. Now we're gonna move on to the CPU. So firstly, we have this plastic cover over the top of the LGA. So we're gonna remove this. Now, we can literally just ping it off, but I'm gonna just very gently put my hand over it just so it doesn't go flying and it comes off in a controlled manner. So thumb up, and that's just gonna break off like that. Now, this is in the bin now, we don't need this anymore. So this is an LGA, a LAN grid array. So all of the CPU pins are in this socket. So we don't want to touch this at all, because if we bend one of these pins, we're bang in trouble. If we do happen to accidentally damage a pin, they can be straightened. However, it's a horrifying job. Look up my other videos if you do happen to bend a pin, and I show you how to repair that kind of damage. So, however, the easiest way is don't break it in the first place. So, we're going to unlock this CPU socket by pushing the locking lever down and pressing it to one side and then letting go. So, it's now in the unlocked position. And now, if we lift that up, it will bring up the cover plate with it. So, now we have the exposed CPU socket. Now, we're going to take our CPU and we're going to find the locator pins on it. So, on an Intel CPU, we have a notch there and a notch there. And those correspond to a notch there and a notch there in the socket. So we're going to make sure that our CPU is that way around. Notice the writing on it. So the writing is facing upwards in the motherboard. 
and we're going to very carefully just lower the CPU into that socket, making sure that it lines up with the notches. Now, this isn't quite in properly, so I'm just going to give it a nudge, and now it's in properly. And to make sure that it's in properly, I'm going to put my finger on the top of it and just wiggle it. And as you can see, it's got a little bit of movement in that CPU socket. That's how I know it's in properly. It shouldn't move out of the CPU socket on its own. Now we can lower the cover, bring the lever down, and now we're going to press the lever into place. You'll need more effort this time around. So here we go, down and in. And now that CPU is locked into place. Now, the top of the CPU, this is a heat spreader, which helps spread the heat from the die of the CPU across the top of the chip. So because this is just metal, we can touch this. It's absolutely fine. Um, however, we do want to try and keep it nice and clean and free of any dust. To mount my Corsair water cooler, uh, I'm going to need a backplate for my CPU cooler. So we're going to take the case upright again and spin it around. And we're going to put another back plate across the back here. You can see this uh, support plate around the CPU socket. We're going to put additional supports over these holes to make sure that the motherboard doesn't bend when our CPU cooler is pressed into it. So our Corsair back plate looks like this. As you can see, it's just a bit of plastic, but that's all we really need. So these uh, screw points here can move in and outwards so it fits a couple of different C chip socket types. So to line it up, I'm simply going to put one of the screws into a hole and then I'm going to line up the one on the opposite side. So let's just make sure that that one's in place. Whoops. And then we do the same thing for this one. Make sure that one's in place. And then we do the same thing for the last one. And then finally, again, I'm just going to give that a bit of a wiggle and there's no movement on that at all. That's nice and solidly in place. Now, this is held in just by those screw holes at the moment. Uh, quite often, these things tend to come with uh, some foam pads that allow you to stick them to the back of the motherboard. However, those pads are not necessary, and I've discovered through experience that you're better off not fitting them just in case you want to remove the cooler at some point. Now we're gonna take the bag of fittings that came with our water cooler and pick out the right standoffs for our CPU. In this case, I'm using the Intel ones, which have a metric thread at both ends. Refer to the manual for your water cooler to know which ones to use. And now we're gonna screw these standoffs into those screw holes. And I'm gonna be very careful so I don't push these back through the motherboard. Otherwise I have to lift it all up and start again. Whoops, this one's just fallen through, but that's okay. I can lift it back up. There we go. Now, as you can see, we've got nice four big standoffs that our water cooler is going to clamp down on top of. So before we mount our water cooler, we need to do a little bit of prep work and put the fans on it because it's easier to mount the fans while it's outside of the case. So we're going to front mount this water cooler. So the radiator is at the front of the case. This means that our water cooler is getting nice cold air from outside the case. It's going straight through the radiator and then into the computer. Um, so the other alternative is to top mount your radiator, which means it's probably going to go either like that or like that. Um, now, if you're top mounting, you're going to have the fans blowing air out of the top of the case. They're going to exhaust out the top. So depending on whether you put your radiator at the top or the front of your case varies on what way round your fans will be. Because I'm front mounting, my fans will be drawing air into the computer. So we're going to put them around this way. Now, case fans always blow toward the label. So find the label where you have the struts and the cable. That is your label. That is the direction of airflow. So this way, we know that our fans are going to go this way around, so they're blowing into the case. Additionally, because I'm going to have my radiator this way around, I want to make sure that my labels are facing upright so they look nice. This is purely aesthetic only. So we're going to make sure that these cables are nicely tied round to the bottom of the fans so they're out of the way. Now for the record, while we're here, I'll just show you a quick comparison between the fans that we've got. If we compare 
the Corsair fan to the Fantex fan that came with the case. Notice how the Corsair fan has much wider blades on it. It's the same number of blades, however they're much wider and flatter. This is a static pressure fan, whereas this is an airflow fan. The difference is, is that a static pressure fan builds more air pressure, static pressure, around the fan, which means it's very good when it's up against a solid object like a radiator or a heat sink. Whereas the airflow fan, it performs much poorly when it's up against a solid surface, but it has a much longer operating range. If we put these two fans side by side, the static pressure fan would be very little use past a few inches, whereas the airflow fan would throw the air all the way out to here and you'd still feel it. So this is more effective as a case airflow fan for getting moving air around inside the case. But this one is more effective as a cooling fan against a hot object. So to mount up our radiator fans, we're going to use the long screws that came with our water cooling kit. So we've got a washer and a long screw. That's gonna go all the way through the fan and into the radiator. Like with all the other screws in the computer, these don't need to be back-breakingly tight. They just need to hold the fan in place. As long as nothing moves, as long as nothing rattles, that's tight enough. Okay, this is ready to go in the case. So I'm gonna very gently just lay everything in place just so I can see where it's gonna go. Now, on my case, on my Fantex here, we've got screw rails all down the front. We've got the 120 mil and 140 mil ones. So I can mount this more or less any position I like. So I'm gonna put it nice and centered height-wise. If you have more fixed rails, you may need to put it nearer the top or nearer the bottom, depending on how it fits in. So use a bit of common sense there. Unfortunately, what I have observed is for some strange reason, my Corsair water cooler has come with fairly long screws for mounting the radiator. And these are actually too long for the case I have. If I actually put this into the front of the radiator here, and screw it in as far as it will go, that's just hit the stop on the other side of the radiator. And we've got a good few millimeters of gap there. My case is not that thick. So in order to alleviate this situation, we're going to use different screws. Now thankfully, again, because standardization, these are imperial thread screws, which means they're the same thread as some of the case screws that came with our chassis. So I've picked out four imperial thread screws from the extra screws I've got with the case, and I can use these to mount this instead. And notice how much shorter this one is, it's not going to stick out of the front. Like with the power supply, I'm just going to put all the screws in very loosely so things can still move around. This makes sure that nothing gets put in in a stressed position. And now I'm just gonna make sure that everything is clear and this can move in a healthy way. So that is just settled in position now, so we can tighten up the screws. And that's our radiator in place. So now we're ready to deal with the business end of the water cooler. Let's remove this plastic cover. Okay, now one of the drawbacks of Corsair water coolers is these big, huge, heavy hoses, which are the bane of my existence. This is the only part about Corsair water coolers I don't like. It makes these, this bit very difficult and very stressful. So. Firstly, I'm going to figure out how we're going to mount this. So I could go straight in that way round, but that's gonna leave my Corsair logo the wrong way up, which is bad for aesthetics, and I care about aesthetics. So let's try twisting this around, see if we can put it in the other way round. So let's twist and turn, and I'm going to support the, the hoses here and put a gentle bend in them round that way. Okay, that's working and with a little bit of movement, that should sit down far enough to clear the side panel as well. So let's go for that. So now we know how we're going to do it. We're going to remove the cover over the top of the head. So now we've exposed the thermal paste that is pre-applied on this. So make sure that the cooler you're fitting has got thermal paste on it. That's the gray stuff. You do need it, it is not optional. This pre-applied thermal paste is absolutely fine. 
If you're a number chaser, you can probably get slightly lower temperatures by using aftermarket thermal paste such as this Arctic MX2 that I use on repairs. However, the stock stuff is absolutely fine for a normal build. Now just before we go for showtime, we're going to make sure that we've got these thumb screws on hand ready because we're going to need to do this in one go. So here we go. We're going to bend into place and put the thumb screws in place. And like with all the other screws, these are not tight, these are just loose right now. And now it's in place, we're going to give it all a little bit of a wiggle and make sure that it's seated comfortably and it's not under stress. The fact that I can move this around tells me that it's not under undue stress. We've got a little bit of movement here, it's not all kinked up and at breaking point. And now that's in place, we can screw these down for real now. So, in comes the screwdriver, we're going down to the stops. Now because I don't want to crush my CPU, we're going to go around all the screws in turn and take them down a little way at a time. Okay, so these have just hit the stops. I've not tightened them using the screwdriver. I've just gone down to the stops and then immediately stopped. Because this is all under tension, again, these things aren't going to fall out on their own and now everything is very solidly in place. There's no wiggle room there at all. So I'm just going to lift that up and just check the back to make sure that my back plate is still looking good, which it's not. Notice that my back plate has just jumped out at the top there. So I'm just going to very gently just guide that back into place. There we go. That's now in properly. And we'll just double check that that's okay, which it is. Good. All right, we're happy. That's our water cooler fitted. So now it's time to do all the wiring for the water cooler. So the first thing I'm going to do is guide all of these wires out to the back of the case. So we're going to route these up the side. And straight out this hole at the top. Pro tip on cable tidying. Notice how on the Corsair water cooler wires, I've turned the wires in such a way that they're very gently looping around. There's no twists or kinks in the cable. It's a nice smooth curve. This makes the wire want to go in the direction that you're pointing it in. Whereas if you just try and bend that all to the left, it's going to try and spring back. And that's why so many people are dependent on cable ties. Whereas if the cable is curling in the direction that it wants to go in, it will stay in that place nice and pretty. And as you can see, we've got a lovely flat cable just traveling along the motherboard there that's in completely invisible when the computer is finished. Okay, right. In order to get my fan cables through to the back of the case, I've got to open up one of my little doorways here. So we're going to open up uh, this one, I believe, which is about halfway up the radiator. So I'm going to unscrew this from the other side. Okay, so now I've got my fan cables through to the back of the computer. We can connect those up to our water cooler fan headers, which we've got from the top. I'm going to swap those around so the longer cable goes to the shorter cable. And just for neatness, we're just going to put this through that cable tie there. Now, this cable here, this is going to power the water cooling pump. We're going to feed this back through the top again, and then that's going to connect to one of our CPU fan headers. So I've plugged that in, and now I have this loop of excess, and we're going to put that, once again, just through here to hold it back and keep any excess from leaking into the case. Done. Now, this obviously has got a little bit of flex on it, but that's fine. Now, if you really want to do show quality level cables, you can tie all this and cable tidy it to your heart's content. However, show quality cable tidying, uh, that is a game that even I am not patient enough for. So, um, yeah, obviously all of this will be out of sight when we're finished. So I'm not going to ruin myself getting all of that done. 
However, what I can do again is I can just grab these little other bits of excess we've got from our front panel connectors and make sure those are tied back as well. Right, and there's our water cooler all fitted up and all cable tidied out the way. So we've also got this little fella. This is our back case fan. That's gonna plug in just behind our CPU power connector there. Now, a lot of the time the case fan header tends to be around this area. It's a common place to put it. If your case fan header is down here, pro tip is to gather your excess cable and put it under the fan and tidy it back there and then plug it in. That keeps it out of the way. When they're up in the top corner like this, it's really easy to just plug this in and just stuff the cable out of sight. Right, we're almost there now. We've got the graphics card and the hard drive to go. So I'm gonna put in the hard drive first because then we can get the supporting wires to that. And then last of all, we drop in the graphics card. So let's flip this thing over and get that hard drive fitted. So our mechanical hard drive is gonna go into this tray here that then slots into the case. Now, most of the time you have to screw your drives into these trays. However, this case has a true toolless design. So this bit here swings out on both sides. Then we're gonna place the hard drive into the tray, making sure that the holes line up. There we go, we can see through the holes there. And then we close these on top, and these pins are gonna go into those screw holes and hold the drive in. And now we've managed to fit this drive without any tools, any screws, any screwdrivers. Beautiful. Right, now we need some power to that drive. We also need to get power to this connector here, which is gonna power the lights and the other power LEDs and things like that on the case. So we're gonna break open the uh, bag of cables that came with our power supply. So these are our modular cables, and we need a serial ATA chain. So what have we got here? We've got three cables, we've got Molex, we've got PCI Express, and Serial ATA. We're gonna need that PCI Express cable as well for our graphics card, so we'll also hold on to that one. And looking at the power supply, I can see that our designated PCI Express connector, that is a bit further down, the white connector there. So I'm actually gonna plug in that PCI Express cable now because it's further away and harder to get to. <clears throat> and now, this cable is gonna come out of this hole here, and that's gonna put it about halfway up the case where the graphics card is. So, let's put that through there. Now to route the power cable, once again, I'm just gonna let the cable fall and just see what directions it wants to turn in. Because of the bends in the cable, it wants to rotate that direction. So I'm gonna let it turn that way. And then when I place it down into this hard drive bay, it's gonna sit there of its own accord. I haven't had to cable tie that in place. It's just sitting there in a nice neat loop on its own. No cable ties needed. And then finally, we can just route this fella up here and plug it in to our uh, case power connector. Most computer cases won't have a power connector like this. However, if your case has a built-in fan controller or any other extensive lights, it'll probably have a SATA connector or an old Molex connector to power it. Luckily, a lot of modern cases have switched over to serial ATA now. If you're unlucky and have a Molex, you're gonna need to plug in one of these Molex chains with the legacy connectors on it. Now, is that gonna stay in place? Hmm. It's okay. Could I run that through the cable management? I could. But it's going to be kind of janky, so I don't really want to. I'm going to leave that as it is. It's not going to go anywhere. And once we put the case panel on, it's not exactly going to fall out. So that's that. Now, we have also need to get a data cable to our hard drive. So let's break out one of our serial ATA cables. This would have come with the motherboard. 
So there's usually two variations of serial ATA cables. You get one that has two straight connectors and one that has a 90 degree connector and another that has a 90 degree connector on it. Now 90 degree connectors are great in situations like this because I can plug that into the hard drive and it gives me some nice straight wires heading down like that, nice and parallel. But if I want to put an SSD in one of these two and a half inch bays here, this 90 degree connector isn't going to fit whichever way around I put it. So in that case, the straight connector comes into play and the straight connector fits just fine. So that's the two instances where you might want one or the other. Of course, you can put the 90 degree connector onto the motherboard as well but generally you'll suffer the same issue if you try and plug a 90 degree connector into your motherboard where it just seems to be at the wrong angle whichever way you have it. So my serial ATA connectors, they're gonna be down the, the bottom of the motherboard as well. So I'm gonna run this cable through this bottom hole near to my uh, PCI Express power. So um, I know that the motherboard connector is going to be this way around and I can check that by turning it over but I don't need to because I've done this enough times. So I know that it's going to go that way around when it plugs into the board. So I'm going to make sure the cable is nice and flat. So it's going to go through this hole and plug straight into the motherboard. And that leaves no kinks or twists in the cable. So let's do that now. And now, in order to get it down to the hard drive, we're now going to fold the cable over like that. So we have a nice smooth curve in the wire. And now down here, as you can see, we've actually, by good fortune, we've actually ended up with the connector in the right orientation. So I can plug straight into the bottom. I'm just gonna push this excess down under the hard drive there. There we go. Our cable went for a bit of a wonder, but that's okay. Right, let's flip this back over and plug that in. So there's our cable coming out, and we're just gonna go straight in to one of the middle connectors. It doesn't matter which one we use, Whichever one it wants to go into is fine. There we go. All right, so we are ready for a graphics card now. It's the only component that's not in the case. So we've got to undo the back screws on our case to remove some of these blanking plates. So I'm gonna undo this. And on my case, I've got this weird, I've got this weird thing here where when I undo these two thumb screws, this kind of hold down bracket comes off the back of the case. Not a big fan of those designs, but that's just how it works. So our graphics card is gonna go in the top PCI Express slot and it's gonna occupy two slots. So we're gonna take out this one and this one. This one is too high and doesn't connect, would go to that slot there, but we're not putting anything in there. Okay, and in comes the graphics card. So. We need to make sure that the slot's locking lever is in the open position, so we push that back. Uh, some of these are locking and they open shut. Sometimes it's just a little uh, spring that you hold that, that just doesn't lock either direction. Have a little look at it and make sure you've figured out how that works. And then get these two prongs at the bottom of the card lined up to go down behind the motherboard there. And that's just gonna drop into the slot and push into place. And now, once you've verified that that is in place and it's nice and happy and it wobbles around like that, we can go ahead and put some screws in to hold that in place. And now I need to put my weird little hold down plate back on. And that just covers up the holes at the back of the case. Right, now we need to pull through our PCI Express cable. Uh, now this doesn't have nearly enough reach on it at the moment, so I'm going to have to find some more excess at the back. So we're going up vertical again. Oh yeah, we've got billions of room on this still. So I'm just going to feed through a bit more of that cable. And turn it round. Wow, still needs more. That's about perfect, I think. So now we've got some excess, we can make sure this is lined up. So once again, we have a locking lever on top of the connector, which corresponds to that notch there. So that tells us which way around this connector is gonna go. 
Now notice we have six plus two for here. So some graphics cards are six pin, some are eight pin, some of them have two sixes, some of them have a six and an eight. So check out what connectors your graphics card has on it and set up your power cable as appropriate. Now, what I tend to do, I tend to feed the whole connector down, plug in that six pin, and then just let the extra two sit next door to it. And that gives us a nice neat setup. But this is kind of just sort of going eh, over the top. I don't really like that aesthetically. So I'm going to reroute this cable. So I'm going to unplug that again. And I'm going to try going around the bottom here. So let's try going under and up. There we go. That looks much nicer. That cable has just got a nice smooth curve on it. If you want ultimate aesthetics, buy yourself some individually braided cable extensions. Those look gorgeous. You can buy them for like, you know, five quid on eBay and they look spectacular. So that's now in place. That little extra two pin, that's just sitting there not connected to anything, but it stops it from just floating, you know. That's there, it's not doing anyone any harm. Right, I think we're all ready here. So finally, I've got some finishing touches to do on, on this case. My power supply ATX lead is all multicolor. This is a Fisher Price look, I don't like it. So I'm gonna grab some fabric tape. So this fabric tape, you can buy it on eBay. It's called stick tape. It's used for repairing hockey sticks and stuff like that. Um, however, functionally, we can use it just like black electrical tape, but it looks really pretty if you wrap it around here. You can cover up the horrible Fisher Price colors. So we're just gonna peel back a little length of that and cut it off. And now I'm just gonna wrap it around our ATX power connector there just to cover up the colorful wires. We want this to be somber and black. There we go. And that little bit of tape there has just hidden up the colorful wires and gotten rid of that horrible Fisher Price look. So it's not ruining the color scheme in our case anymore. Cool. Right, we're ready to reassemble this case. Then the last thing I need to do is I've got to fit my LED strip somewhere, wherever that's gone. Okay, let's put some side panels on this thing. So we're gonna take it upright again. And I'm gonna put my front panel back on. Now we're gonna put on this panel. So I'm gonna lay it flat. Now, if you've got some cables that are sticking out a bit, you might need to crush your cables down slightly. That's okay, it's common. A lot of people have to do that with their cases. So we're gonna lay everything flat, make sure all our cables are where we want them to lay. And then I'm going to just rest the panel on top, like so. Then I'm just gonna guide it into place. Now, I'm gonna lay both arms on the sides, like so. Put my hands on the back and just slide it shut. Now, that sounded excessively complicated, but by doing it that way, I've made sure that all of the catches are all perfectly flat. None of those catches are in the wrong place. A very common fault I see is that someone has put the side panel on while it's upright or in situ or something like that, and there's a little bit like the top bit is sticking out. It's got a gap in it where it's not quite on properly. Whereas when you lay it flat, put your arms across it, you'll get a completely flush finish every single time. Super easy. Right, now before I close this up forever, or at least until it next gets some servicing and upgrades, I'm going to post test it. So it's time to turn it on and see if it works. So I need power, I need HDMI, and I need a keyboard and mouse. Wireless keyboard and mouse. Okay, here we go. So, power switch at the back, and power switch at the top. We've got lights, we've got fans. Now we're just gonna wait for that post sign.
Okay, it turned off then on again. That's fine. Some motherboards do this when they've been turned on for the first time. It's completely normal. And there we go. Reboots and selects proper boot device. So the computer posted, which means it turned on and it's ready to start up. It has no operating system, so it hasn't gotten anywhere yet. However, the fact that we have a boot error means that the system has started and is ready to work. So we know it all works. So, last item of business for me is I've got this LED strip that I want to put somewhere. So I'm going to plug this in and I'm going to see where best to put it. Oh, that's funky. So this LED strip has got uh, magnets in it, so it'll clip wherever I want to put it. Super cool. So the obvious places to put it are at the top or at the bottom. Now, let's plug it in. All right, we've got a nice sea green by default. This is RGB, so it can be whatever color I want it to be. It looks more white on the screen, but yeah. Okay, so if I put that along the top, that's gonna shine down into the case. But the disadvantage of that is that the graphics card casts a massive shadow over everything. So you get kind of uneven lighting. If I put it at the bottom of the computer, then it's gonna shine upwards, but then the graphics card casts a shadow over the top half of the case. So that's kind of naff. The other disadvantage of having it at the bottom is when I look down at the computer, all I will see is those lights, and it'll be really annoying. So what I do, what if I put it over here? That's not bad. That's gonna shine light all across here. However, it's gonna be a bit dim by the time we get to this part of the case. That might just work. And then finally, our other option is to put it over here. However, this fan is in the way there, and I'm not gonna be able to keep it out of sight. If that fan wasn't there, I could put it along there, and that would be cool. But then if it was sitting on a desk, my eye line is gonna see the lights, which is kind of naff. So I'm gonna put it over here. Okay, right, my LED strip is fitted. It's time to put the side panel back on. So, firstly, I'm going to deliberately put this on upside down. Bear with me, there is a reason for this. When you have a brand new glass panel like this, it's going to be super clean, like out of the factory clean. But the bad news is that means it's going to attract fingerprints and dust like nothing else you've ever seen. Like that, horrifying. So, I've put it upside down, flat on the case, so I have a nice flat surface to clean now. So I'm gonna take some multi-surface polish, just ordinary glass, just ordinary Mr. Sheen. I'm gonna go, and then a microfiber cloth, and we're gonna wipe this down. Then turn the cloth over and buff to a sheen. And now that, that multi-surface polish that we've just put on there is gonna leave a layer on the glass that will reject dust. So now we're gonna pick the panel up and turn it over. Oop. And we're gonna repeat the exercise. And now we're all nicely polished up, we can put our thumb screws back in. I've got to try and do this without touching the glass now. <laughs> However, because we've used polish on this, this should be, yeah, I can run my finger across that without leaving finger marks on it now. That's the idea of the polish, is it actually leaves a protection layer on the glass to stop it from picking up every tiny little smudge that touches it. The problem is much worse when you have a plastic window because the plastic will gain a static charge that will actually attract dust to it. So it's even more horrifying. There we go. Beautiful. So let's turn this back on again. And now I want to make it the right color because we've got some mixed colors here. So let's find my RGB color button and see what it does. Right, I've set my RGB LEDs to white for now just so we get a sort of an even glow throughout this case. So, we're back on post and it's all running. I think it's ready to do those finishing shots of it now.
Thank you very much for watching, everyone. I'll see you all next time.